Um, with that, I'd like to introduce some of our uh, USDA counterparts or, or cooperators, I should say. So uh, Aaron Otto and Matt Travis. Uh, I see Aaron working up her presentation. Um, so go ahead and take it away, Aaron and Matt. All right. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity this afternoon to talk a little bit about the Spotter Lanternfly program here for um, SLF 101. Um, my name is Aaron Otto and I am the National Policy Manager for USDA APHIS, and uh, my program is Plant Protection and Quarantine, PPQ. Um, so the three main people that are working in PPQ, um, well, not main, there's a lot of people working on SLF and PPQ, but uh, we make up a cross-functional working group to uh, sort of cover the three core functional areas of PPQ. So while I'm managing national policy, um, Matt Travis is our multi-state coordinator for SLF and he's covering field ops as um, core functional area. And then lastly, we have Greg Para, who's our staff scientist who uh, covers the science and technology core functional area. Uh, Matt and I will be talking today, but Greg, you'll hear more about uh, more from him during the summit, he's going to be moderating the part of the research portion of the summit uh, the, that will happen uh, March 1st through 3rd. So let me just go ahead and get into it. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the background of SLF. We've, we've heard a lot today, so I'm not going to dwell that much on it. Uh, then I'll talk about the program goals for the SLF uh, cooperative program. We'll talk about um, some of the activities that take place um, within the program. And then we'll talk about um, funding. So without further ado, um, the SLF, you know, we've all learned uh, that it got here in 2014. It's now in 11 states. We have 11 states with populations. Um, it is a pest that has multiple hosts during its life cycle. Although its most preferred host is that tree of heaven, the Alanthus altissima. Um, here you see uh, some nice pictures of several of the life stages, um, whether it's first through third, that black and white one, the fourth is the red instar with black dots, and then we got our adult there, and then a nice picture of the newly hatched nymphs. Uh, the pest it adversely affects a uh, many agricultural crops. Here we have grapes, hops, fruit trees, and ornamental trees that uh, could be adversely affected. And you've heard from a lot of our partners this morning uh, talking about the effects of SLF on some of these cropping systems. The SLF program is a coordinated program between uh, APHIS, PPQ, and the states. Um, we work really hard to coordinate with our state partners and work on containing and suppressing the SLF um, in the generally infested area and eradicating or attempting to eradicate from the satellite populations. Um, so we have some six major program goals that we work on um, for the program. So first of all, we focus primary control measures based on the data uh, that identifies key SLF infested areas and established populations. We also focus primary control measures on those high transportation pathways and commodity pathways to minimize the risk of long distance dispersal of SLF. Uh, we rapidly respond to, with control strategies to SLF satellite populations as they're discovered. We also promote the development, harmonization, and implementation best of best management practices for all sorts of industries, uh, many varied businesses, and lots of different uh, growers and different cropping systems to address the risk of long distance movement. We pro promote the harmonization of state SLF regulatory and data collection activities across the SLF program so that from year to year we can get a better, we can get more information about the pest and how it behaves. Uh, and also, lastly, we maximize SLF education management recommendations and citizen reporting by supporting robust outreach strategies. So we are working with our, our state partners at the federal level. 
um, while they work at the state level. So I'm gonna pass this over to Matt now, who's going to talk a little bit about the yearly population. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. And so you've seen uh, several different versions of maps uh, today, um, but this is the map uh, that we typically refer to as the blob map. Uh, this is the map showing the expansion of spotted lanternfly really since 2018 when uh, USDA APHIS PPQ really became engaged in 2017, 2018. Um, up until to, uh, last year, 2021. And as you can see from the expansion, um, we had some key areas where it really expanded. And if I had an overlay uh, with pathways, uh, especially transportation pathways, you would see that overlay and see the relationship there, which would be very key and instrumental in this expansion as, uh, as this pest has furthered its range across multiple states, like Aaron said, 11 states right now. And so operationally, we focus on high risk pathways. We, we can't be everywhere. Uh, we don't have the resources, the manpower, and even with partners, we all agree we can't, we can and we'll try, but we can't get everywhere. So we need to prioritize really where we're gonna operationally focus our efforts. And so we look at the pathways that are most likely to distribute life stages of spotted lanternfly. And so these are high risk pathways. Uh, we too use the models that you saw Matt Helmus uh, earlier present. We also have some modeling and analytics behind some of this. And so using this knowledge, we identify high traffic rail uh, and transit pathways, high volume shipping operations and cooperators. Of course, maritime ports of entry, we heard those spoken about. We've heard airports talked about as well. Uh, DOD facilities are key as, the Department of Defense uh, owns quite a lot of property. If you look at also the US Army Corps of Engineers, um, one of the largest landholders uh, in the federal system, and they move a lot of equipment from state to state, either in emergency response or of course, uh, in response to potential future deployments overseas. And then national parks and battlefields. And again, uh, very large land um, owners here, land managers, uh, our national parks and battlefields are very visited, of course, by a lot of visitors and tourists, and, and they're coming from all over the place. So obviously an area that we also uh, are aware of that has the potential and is considered high risk because it, it can uh, move spotted lanternfly once established uh, in some of these areas. The next slide, Aaron, please. And so one of the things that we do are very involved with is uh, program surveillance, operational surveillance of the pest. You've heard discussions about survey. And so we look at the different tactics for survey. We work with our science and technology uh, collaborators and cooperators to, to uh, develop and, and really use in the field uh, the best visual or our best survey techniques and tactics that we can. So we have visual survey is very effective. We've seen it time and time again, uh, be very effective, whether that's the public reporting or that we have actual survey teams out there. Uh, visual survey is still, in a very, is still a very effective tool. Public reporting, you've heard that spoken about, whether it was Jillian or Jay and others. Uh, public reporting is very key and has, a, has uh, uh, clued us into populations we didn't know about. And then we have the circle trap, and that's the picture to the right there of the uh, of the words of the of the text. Uh, you'll see the circle trap. That is one of the primary traps that we use in the program, and it's very effective as it as it keys in on the uh, adult climbing up that vertical surface and then getting caught in that in that bag. Uh, we're able to go in and remove that bag, replace it with a new fresh bag. And that's uh, one of the tools what you, we use for survey. And then we've heard talk about sentinel trees, establishing sentinel trees um, in an area uh, by allowing certain Alanthus trees to remain there and using those trees really uh, for uh, a type of, for a tactic as, uh, for survey. And then really it becomes uh, using and employing multiple surveillance techniques. Um, and tactics. There's really not any one that we rely on more than the others. Uh, it really is a combination. And we found that over time operationally, uh, it's that, it's that uh, 
multiple approach, a multiple tool approach that's really given us uh, the best, uh, you know, the best effect, the best goals, uh, achievement of goals as we look for this. And we're always looking for new tactics, looking for new science, ways to attract, ways to look for uh, spotted lanternfly in a more efficient way. Okay, so I'm gonna take it over for a couple slides and we're gonna talk about program environmental compliance. So with uh, federal programs, uh, there are other federal statutes that we must uh, follow for any sort of activities that we, we do in the program. And so this is where the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA um, comes in as well as many other acts like the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, Migratory Bird Act. There's a lot of acts um, that we have to follow at the federal level um, when, it talk, when we're talking about program activities. So we are currently, the biggest one um, that we deal with along with the Endangered Species Act, ESA, is NEPA. And the purpose of NEPA is that it ensures agencies consider the significant environmental consequences of their proposed actions and inform the public about their decision-making. So it's a robust process to make sure that um, we've considered all the options when it comes to, uh, to things like treatment and also um, that the public is involved with our decision-making process. Uh, the Spider and Lanternfly program is currently working under the Environmental Assessment and Finding of No Significant Impact or FONSI that was published in June, 2020. And that covers um, several states, uh, the Mid-Atlantic, and then several states uh, that are sort of collaring those states in the Mid-Atlantic. So uh, the current EA that we're working under um, is covers states, Connecticut, Delaware, the District of Columbia, Kentucky, Maryland, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia. Um, in the fall of 2020, um, we went ahead and started the process of creating a supplemental environmental assessment. And that is to uh, allow the federal program to uh, uh, use mist blowing as a treatment type with two pyrethroids along rail and rail properties. And that uh, those rail properties would be in PA and in some counties in Maryland, Ohio, West Virginia and Virginia. So counties that from PA that sort of head out towards uh, the Mingo Junction area of Ohio, as well as uh, areas that go through Maryland uh, and West Virginia south to Virginia towards the Winchester area along that rail corridor. Um, that took us about a year um, and that finally went into place October, 2021. And links to both of those uh, environmental compliance uh, documents um, are, and the FONSIs attached to them, are at the website. If you go to the APHIS PPQ um, SLF website, you'll find them there. Okay. Let me move on to Matt. And so one of the other areas and one of the other things that, of course, uh, we're very engaged in and, and working very closely with a lot of our partners on uh, our program treatments. Um, again, focusing on the priority, priority properties and, and high-risk pathways, as, as we spoke about, as I talked about, we look at various treatment tactics. Uh, we work with collaborators, again, developing or working with them and using the best science available to find out what's most effective, uh, what we can use uh, that gets us uh, you know, the most efficacy out of our treatments. And so the first there is egg mass treatments uh, with golden pest spray oil directly on egg masses. That's something that we've been using increasingly more and more. Uh, we started last November, uh, this past November in um, 2021 uh, with uh, golden pest spray oil. And that's a treatment directly on the egg masses. Uh, we're treating those egg masses on the trunks of the trees. And, and then of course they, they are not hatching, they're not viable. So that allows us to uh, reduce the population in that way. 
Uh, we then pick up those treatments again in the spring. And really the, the reason we do that, uh, we kind of transition from spraying to egg mass scraping, as you've heard people mention, is because of temperatures and anything below 40, once we get below 40, uh, golden pest spray oil just becomes very difficult to use. Uh, it solidifies, it gels, and it be just, just becomes very difficult uh, to manage and use. So we go, go uh, this period when it's really cold into egg mass scraping, but then we pick it back up in the spring. Uh, early spring, we'll start spraying uh, golden pest spray oil on the egg masses once again, and treating those egg masses again, reducing populations in some of those high priority areas. We talked about trap trees that was mentioned several times by several of the presenters previously, uh, doing direct bark uh, of direct, direct bark or foliar applications, of systemic insecticides, especially on Alanthus or tree of heaven, and then and treating those trees and allowing those trees to absorb the systemic and then of course, uh, be that toxic trap tree for those insects feeding on it. Um, when they hatch and emerge. And in broadcast treatments, uh, applying contact insecticides, uh, we have uh, gone to two pyrethroids, as Aaron mentioned, um, bifenthrin and beta cyfluthrin, and we've applied those in different ways. First, uh, manual uh, backpack sprayers, uh, either using a bark spray or a broadcast, uh, truck mounted uh, spray rigs using hydraulic guns, or as Aaron mentioned with the, the supplemental EA, uh, we recently added mist spraying or mist blowing uh, use of our bifenthrin or contact insecticides. And again, the targets there uh, is really to knock down the population, suppress the population, especially in high population areas in our high priority sites, you know, preventing uh, whether it's the adult making that hitchhiking ride on the airplane, uh, getting aboard a vessel, a ship, or make, taking a trip on rail, that's really what we're targeting there, knocking those populations down and trying to keep the, the population suppressed from making those long distance trips into other states. Next slide, please, Aaron. And then outreach, and a lot of people have talked about outreach. Outreach is certainly a very important part, working with the partners, getting the message out, getting the message out to the public, getting the message out to transportation. We've heard that, you know, we're working with some different partners. Um, you know, we've worked uh, historically very closely with the states and the National Plant Board, but we're now in a situation where we're working with industries that some of us are not used to working with in transportation, whether that's rail, uh, tractor trailer, uh, motor freight, um, uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft cargo carriers, maritime, maritime cargo carriers, just a whole host of different types of industries that we have to get the word out to. Nurseries and growers, of course, we also have some historic relationship there, but we always want to make sure that we're uh, carrying the, the message to them as they move nursery stock uh, from state to state. And of course, looking at all, all retail, uh, whether that's the distribution warehouses, like your big box store distribution warehouses, or, or the, small, the small distribution warehouses moving goods uh, from state to state uh, via truck, via box truck uh, along our highways uh, into other states. And then the general public. And, and again, as, as you heard Jay and Jillian talk about it, uh, the, the general public really has become an ally uh, here in our fight against spotted lanternfly. Uh, we're working very closely with them, whether it's public service announcement, announcements, pest, uh, pest alerts, uh, our websites, social media, and live media events. And, and as you heard from all the states, they've used these tools as well. We have a national website, as Aaron mentioned, and then of course there's Hungry Pests, which also give us two primary avenues for getting the message out to people uh, about spotted lanternfly, as well as materials that they can use and print um, to use uh, in their local communities. And here's just an example. Uh, here's an example with uh, some of the outreach uh, resources that I talked about. Hungry Pest website, and there's the website there. And then the, the, the Spotted Lanternfly website, and of course, stopslf.org. Many of you are probably aware of that as you went there to register for this event. 
Um, but uh, those are some really good resources, really help us get the message out to the general public. And uh, obviously are vi is very educational um, for everyone, industry and uh, the general public alike. So the three, the, there's three legs of that stool though. So we have regulatory, we have field operations, and then uh, we have policy field operations. And then we also have uh, science and technology. And for fiscal year uh, 2022, uh, there's lots of planned SLF research um, activities that are happening. Um, there are three areas of strategic research for SLF. Um, the first being to develop and optimize treatment tools and strategies, uh, not only for the program, but hopefully for the future for growers of affected um, commodities. To optimize detection and survey strategies and tools. Um, right now, we rely heavily on visual inspection. Um, we do have traps, but uh, traps are as good as the insects going into them. Um, so if they decide not to go into the trap, um, that's where we're at. So we're still heavily reliant on visual survey. So hopefully in the future, we'll be able to optimize some detection and, and get some, uh, some different and optimized survey tools. Um, and then also develop biological control strategies. Um, PPQ has been working with par partners in uh, research partners in China um, to look for different parasitoids that might be useful in this fight. Again, with biological control strategies, they take a, a long time to develop. Um, with this insect being one generation a year, a univoltine, um, it's going to take uh, several years uh, because we can't do research uh, back to back like we can with other insects, like maybe fruit flies or things like that. Um, so uh, it's a little slower process when you're dealing with one generation of an insect a year. Um, there are some possibilities uh, that are on the horizon. Um, we are looking at uh, a, a egg parasitoid and a nymphal parasitoid. Um, those are two candidates that are being researched now, um, as well as um, there's also some research being done on maybe some antipathy entomopathic um, uh, fungi uh, that Cornell has been working on. So there's a lot of researchers, not only in PPQ, but our uh, state ag schools um, and lots of um, partners uh, in academia, as well as USDA Agricultural Research Service. All of these partners are working on these basic three areas to gather more information and hopefully optimize tools and strategies for the future as we move into the future of SLF. Now, this is a question I get the most and it's funding, <laughs> understandably. So for fiscal year um, 2022, the appropriations for SLF are not final. Um, I haven't even heard today whether, um, you know, those that continuing resolution has gotten through the Senate. Um, so again, we're just kind of waiting for our numbers to get official numbers. Uh, last year for fiscal year 21, SLF was appropriated uh, approximately $16 million for the program. Um, so we're hoping that at least those stable levels will come to us again. Um, also for fiscal year 2022, there is something called uh, the uh, spending plan was just released and that was released for the Plant Protection Act Section 7721. Um, those are funds that are available. And this year, in this year's spending plan, we had more than 2 million that went to suggestions that, that covered uh, topics of SLF research, SLF outreach, and SLF survey. Um, someone asked me earlier um, about if there's funding for call centers. Uh, this would be the area where you would go to to put in a suggestion for that sort of outreach and information. Um, and I, I will put in the chat the, um, the website for PPA 7721. Um, for next year, usually the suggestions for the next fiscal year 
Um, so for fiscal year 2023, those will have to be submitted usually in the summer, June or July, I believe. And then there's a vetting process that happens um, as the suggestions are vetted and then also funding decisions are made. Um, in addition to the, the goal spending that goes along with section 7721, there are six goals underneath that section. Um, there's also something called the Rapid Response Fund that is also tied to Plant Protection Act 7721. Uh, right now, PPQ is reviewing operational funding requests from the states um, to uh, determine funding levels from that fund for SLF. And there is the website. And again, I will put it in the chat so that everyone can see it, but this is for next year usually do about July. And here's the caveat. Um, a lot of people ask me about funding for treatments. Um, when it comes to treatments, um, federal funding is only available for the treatments that are listed in the current EA and only available for the states listed in the current environmental assessment. PPQ recognizes that there are states not covered by the EA and we're working to uh, develop uh, solutions for that in the future. But as of right now, uh, funding from PPA 7721, federal funding um, cannot cover treatments that are not listed in the EA and it can't cover states not included in the EA. And with that, I have a nice little picture of a spotter lanternfly. So I am gonna stop sharing my screen and see if there's any questions. Erin, I've got a question. Can you hear me? Yes. So um, the operational funding requests through PPA 7721 for a rapid response, is there a formal process to that or is it just, uh, you know, you talk to your spud and you guys figure something out and he makes a request or, how does that work? So the operational suggestions that came in um, during the regular process um, are vetted for the rapid response fund. And so currently those, um, those operational suggestions that came in during the regular uh, goal six review are in front of the management team and they're trying to make decisions on, on funding levels for those, I wanna say eight or nine suggestions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Aaron, there was a question that popped up in the chat about uh, I don't want to I don't know if you want to go down this rabbit hole or not, but um, is is Virginia listed in the EA? I mean, is this something that you could rattle off those states off the top of your head real quick for everybody on? Um, Virginia is in the EA. Um, let me see if I can rattle off the states again. <laughs> I'm no, sorry to do that to you. <laughs> no, no, no. I have it in my PowerPoint. I can just pull up that slide. Um, Da, ba, da. There it is. All right. So current states in the June 2020 um, environmental assessment, that would be Connecticut, Delaware, District of Columbia, Kentucky, Maryland, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the Q and A for for you or Matt. I have one actually. Um, real simple one is uh, is dinotefuran still the prefer preferred um, systemic application or, or product for uh, uh, for the for the sentinel trees? Uh, yes, Scott. Di uh, Dino is the primary that we use. The environmental assessment, if you see, look at it under table one, does include um, imidacloprid, but it's really not something that I've seen a lot of states, you know, use. Uh, I think it's because of the some of the, you know, perception, the public perception about imidacloprid and and you know its its uh, effect on non-targets. So I think a lot of people, but use or prefer to use dinotefuran over imidacloprid. 
uh, but Dino is is the preferred product uh, for the uh, trap trees. Okay, I, I remember that one being used more commonly on EAB for the for the trunk right. sprays versus injections as well. So makes sense. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't see. Yeah, was there another one that just popped up? Uh, yeah, I can answer yeah. that question about the. Okay, EAB. great. Okay, so with the NEPA process, with the National Environmental Policy Act, when you start that. Um, there's kind of two roads that you go down. There's the environmental assessment road. Um, and usually those are for um, programs that or actions that are um, small in scope where you will end up with a finding of no significant impact. Um, so the amount of work that we, we are doing under the current EA still falls under the, uh, the finding of no significant impact. Um, if the EA went ahead and we looked at it um, and we added more states or tried to add more states, we would more than likely come up with a finding of significant impact because now we've added much more land, much more scope, as well as we're adding many, many more types of, of endangered species, of habitats and things like that. So that would push us to something that is called an environmental impact statement. Now the environmental impact statement um, is something that takes longer than the EA. So we cannot just add states to the EA um, as currently written. And so PPQ is um, tr trying to um, develop uh, solutions to that, um, whether it's doing a full, it, the decision hasn't been made on what kind of EIS or additional environmental documentation could occur. Uh, there's a lot of different types of EISs, so um, so stay stay hold. That decision should be coming. I would say probably by summer ish. Um, so, but yeah, we can't just add. It's not as easy as just adding a state and just typing it in. There's a lot of paperwork and a lot of analysis that needs to take place. I would say sounds good, but I don't think that comes as a surprise to anybody. So thank you, Aaron. <laughs> I'm, gonna throw um, Gary, I'm gonna throw Gary's question out there because it's a really good one. Are you folks commenting on the Senate Bill 203283 that will ban all neonics? Am I? Well, I'm, I'm sure it's the state people that he's talking to. Okay. I, I'm I'm not I'm certainly not going to directly respond to that, uh, but I will tell you. I mean, as we work with states, we've seen this happen. Um, multiple states at the state legislature level have taken steps to remove neonic, you know, usage sure. from their from their inventory. Um, we work with the states as closely as possible. Uh, thank heavens, most cases, it becomes a highly restricted pesticide, which uh, is only usable by licensed professionals. Um, so, you know, we've, we've handled that or dealt with that a little bit. I can't speak to the, the Senate bill or the abandonment of neonic. Um, so I can't, I can't really speak to that right now. We'll have to see, but we, we realize that that's out there. We've seen that also with other products that we've considered, um, which is why we're constantly looking for new products um, that aren't in the classes as, as the same class as neonicotinoids or pyrethroids. We are looking for other alternatives to, to those two chemistries. I think that makes sense. And again, I'm not going to touch that one for everybody, but it's probably something that we're all going to have to navigate one way or another at some point based on our individual states as well and, and where this bug pops up. So um, with that, I want to thank you both. Um, appreciate it. There's a there's a couple of questions in there if you want to just take a look and see if it's something that would fit into to your uh, wheelhouses. But I do want to try and stay on for the break. Um, so if everyone can uh, bow out for about uh, 10 minutes, we'll come back at one or 140 Central, 240 Eastern. Uh, <laughs> uh, for our last section of the day, uh, a final panel discussion uh, uh, with a handful of states. So we'll see everybody back soon. <laughs>